Hi friends, welcome. So before I start today, I have to brag a little bit because I went out on a limb. I asked Claudia Freelander. Now, I don't know if you know Claudia Friedlander, but if you don't, why don't you? And Or maybe you're a fangirl like me. And if you're not, why aren't you? She's awesome. She is the author of this book, The Complete Vocal Fitness Guide, A Singer's Guide to Physical, physical Training, Anatomy, and Biomechanics, which... <laughs> Can you tell I'm not wearing my glasses? Anyway, this is this is a great handbook. I refer to it often. I've had it for a couple of years. I refer to it quite a bit. And Claudia is, I don't know what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what Claudia wants to talk about. But whatever it is, it's going to be interesting. Because Claudia is really smart, really articulate, has great ideas. You don't want to miss it. So I just want to, I just want to say... I asked Claudia for you, and she said yes, just for you. So I'm very happy about that. So be here next week when I talk to Claudia Friedlander. Okay, now, if you have had voice lessons, this is our, our today thing. Here's my title. If you have ever had voice lessons, you've probably heard this. Your voice teacher told you that there are healthy and unhealthy ways to sing. And that if you do certain things with your voice, those things are wrong and they could lead to vocal trouble. So that's concerning, right? Maybe they never told you why these things you were doing were wrong, just that they were wrong. They were just bad. They just don't do them. And and who were you to argue? They're the teacher. You're, they're telling you these things and that's why you go to them. Or maybe... You were the kid who did not take the voice lessons, who just, you were like in the band or whatever, but still, you're a singer. You are a singer, and so even if you weren't taking voice lessons proper, you might have coached here and there, or, or worked with a pre-recorded kind of course, or had an online teaching project, or you watch YouTube videos, whatever. Wherever you've been, you've heard it. I'm sure you've heard it. And now you're a singer who teaches other singers. So if you've only had a little exposure to this idea, then maybe you just you just kind of wonder about it. Like, you just remember that there are certain things a singer can do that could end up being very, very bad things, or things that could hurt their voice. Or you may, you may have been bathed in this idea from the very beginning of your singing journey. Like, say you ended up as a voice major at a college or a university or conservatory. If that was your story, you may have been guided within, you know, rather specific confines about, sonic confines, about what sounds were desired and what sounds were dangerous or unhealthy or just wrong. So whatever your situation you may have an idea in your head that in order to do the best thing for your students, which we know you want to do, you have to be on the lookout for unhealthy sounds and habits. And you have to help your students not make those sounds. Now, here's the tricky bit. The tricky bit comes in when you have students who want to sing popular styles. Because, and if you are an independent teacher, or if you are an adjunct teacher, those singers represent something between most and all of your students. They want to focus on popular styles. Even if your students are music theater, um, sorry, let me try that again. Even if your students are music theater singers, you have to address popular styles. But I don't have to tell you that. You've listened to the cast recordings, you know. <laughs> you know what they're doing. So there you are. You want to do the best thing for your students, and you're pretty sure that what they want isn't the best thing for their vocal health all the time. So what do you do? That's our question. So I hope today's broadcast is going to help you with that. Uh, and even better, I hope that what I'm giving away today will help you with your popular styles mojo. So stay with me. I am Meredith Colby. I am the author of Money Notes, How to Sing High, Loud, Healthy, and Forever, which introduces NeuroVocal for Popular Styles, a way to sing that is based on brain science. I am a voice coach specializing in popular styles 
and you can schedule directly with me from my website. I also teach classes for teachers, which we have two more days of registration for this class, and we have one more spot in each section. So if you want to join us for this class, it's going to be awesome, um, and I hope you will join us. Do, just like I'm going to, I have to cut it off on Wednesday night. Uh, today is Monday, so a couple more days. Addition, there will be an additional discount if you're on my mailing list. People on my mailing list get a discount. So this is the last time I'm offering this as a nine-week class. So I will have it again next year, but it's going to be a different thing. So go to the information page on my website and get the information for that. And you will be glad you did because it's going to be great. Hearts and thumbs, thanks for being here with me today or on the replay. So please feel free to share your thoughts, your experiences, your comments. I'd love to get your comments during, after, whatever, on the replay. If you can, thank you for the thumbs. They help me when you, when you click those hearts or thumbs. Facebook likes me better, so it's, it is a gift to me, and I thank you. If you are watching on YouTube, please like, please follow, all the stuff. Thank you. And uh, this is my freebie today. So this is the freebie that I was offering. It is really good. It is the PDF download of my guide to developing styles. It's two parts. The first part is for you to sort of, thanks for the heart, for you to sort of like adjust your pop goggles so that you're seeing the world through the lens of various microphone based genres. And then the second part gives you some practical ideas and techniques that you can use in your studio with your students. So if you put dangerous in the chat, the NeuroVocal bot will send you the link to that download. If you're watching on YouTube, you can get it in the dis video description below. And if you're on my email list, you got it in your inbox this morning. You don't have to sign up for anything. You're already there. Okay, there you go. It's, it is good. You should download it. <laughs> now let's get to it. All right. There's our subject now. In my perfect world, I would just play you some videos of famous pop singers who are in their 70s and still sound great. I'd be like, look, you're hearing all kinds of vocal stylings that they're doing, and you can hear that their voices haven't really changed in the last 50 years. So clearly what they're doing is sustainable. I would say that. You'd go, you're right, Meredith, and then we'd be done, and we'd go, you know, have a beer or whatever. That's what would happen. But... That would leave some important questions unanswered. And so we're going to dig a little bit deeper than just the demonstration plus beer talk. So, for instance, you might say to me, Meredith, you say that these aforementioned singers have been doing all these dangerous things for all these years, and they still sound great. But my voice teacher, or more than one voice teacher, whom I trust and admire, someone who helped me with my classical singing, someone who gave me an understanding of this beautiful art form. This teacher never let me make those sounds. Those sounds were not part of what I learned. Or if it ever did come up, it was only to point out that these sound, sounds were not what we were going for. <laughs> so you might even tell me that you yourself have spent time listening to pop singers and noticing all the things they do wrong. You may have made predictions about the future vocal health of these singers, of microphone-based genres, because, let's face it, they do not follow the rules that you may have been taught. So, you'll be glad to know that I am going to agree that your beloved and trusted voice teacher was not wrong. You should absolutely not, except in particular circumstances, make these sounds in Western classical music. <laughs> in Western classical music, it is decidedly not okay to scoop or attack a vowel with a vocal fry or growl. It is a big no-no to improvise unless a condensa is indicated or to change the melody that you have been given to sing. These are not good things. A breathy head voice is something that you need to fix not something that you are using as a stylistic choice, right? Those are the rules. The thing that your voice teacher did not specify 
is that the reason you should not do these things is that they are part of a specific genre. Why? There are a number of reasons, which my friend Shannon Coates likes to talk about, but one of the reasons, then the reason I'm going to focus on right now, is, the, is that Western classical music is based on the assumption that it will be performed in an acoustic setting. <laughs> you have to be heard without a microphone. And since it's 1840, the microphone has not yet been invented. The voice itself has to create enough volume to be heard. And many of the considerations that define Western classical singing came up around that need to be loud. So if you move popular styles into the category of music that is sung into microphones, then they take on a whole new meaning, right? In amplified music, it is the amplification, so the microphone, that's doing the heavy lifting, not the voice. So many of these vocal affectations used by singers of microphone-based genres simply cannot be heard without a microphone. But when the singer is using a microphone, style just goes with the territory. Okay, so there's the one thing. Now, you also might say to me, yeah, but Meredith, just because something is quiet doesn't mean it's right. And it doesn't mean it won't hurt your voice. And once again, because I am an agreeable person, I would agree with you. But I would also feel compelled, because I'm an opinionated person, I would feel compelled to point out that people don't use these stylistic devices that you question all the time. Singers make and use various stylistic choices throughout a song. I Personally, I think of these textural and melodic variations and choices as a stylistic vocabulary. And they're just typically used sporadically and intuitively throughout a song. Do I have this? Yes. So stylistic occurrences, stylistic choices are occurrences in a song. They are not the fundamental sound. So that's a big deal. That makes a huge difference. The whole point of vocal style is that the singer is or is seen to be in the moment with the music. So I say is seen to be because I recently saw <laughs> I recently saw a video of Billie Eilish showing her composite vocal on one of her tracks. It's called a comp vocal. And there were probably I, I couldn't, I mean, hundreds, there were hundreds of tiny, teeny, tiny little phrases that were like put together. So that's why I say that if it's, if it's live, then yes, you are seeing someone be in, in the moment. And if it's a recording, they may be seen to be in the moment. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. It's just a thing to know about. Anyway, they are committing to the song. Again, we'll, we'll think live, okay? They're committing to the song and bringing their personal artistry to it. They're bringing textures to the tone that are unique to the human voice. They're adding inflections or changing melodies in a way that comes out of their musical sensibilities. And so that makes them the interpreter of the song. They may be, or, or the, even if they wrote the song, they're still interpreting in, in that moment at that time. They may be bringing forth the lyric in a way that makes sense to them from a narrative point of view. The stylistic choices a singer makes are usually part of the genre that they're singing. So not only are they okay, they're desirable. They are necessary. <laughs> so as a teacher or coach, you not only have to find a way to be okay with these sounds and these affects, but you have to be able to help your students achieve them. And that, that's what we're going to try to help you move toward today. Just we're going to try to move the needle a little bit. Um, will you put, if you want to get the guide to vocal style, which hopefully is, it is designed to help you, both your thinking and your skills, put dangerous in the comments and the NeuroVocal bot will let you sign up to get that PDF download. If you're watching on 
YouTube. You can find it in the comments below. So what else do I have to say about that? Nothing. Okay. Just a reminder. Just, just a reminder that you can get that. If you are feeling at all resistant to what I'm talking about today, or if you're a little bit interested in taking a closer look at this subject, I'm going to ask you to do something. Just, this is just, you're going to do this and kind of help move your needle a little bit, okay? And see how it affects you. It, it affects different people in different ways, depending on what your background and values and personality are. So just, so this is just a thing for you to try, okay? So the first part of this thing is to try listening to a song in a genre that you don't normally listen to. So sometime in the next week, if you say you hate country music, listen to a country song. If you think all singer songwriters are just like whine and whisper, I recently read that. They're all whine and whisper. So then listen to a singer songwriter. If you, if you don't know where to find them, ask your students for a recommendation or some handy nearby teenager. There is a station on Sirius XM called the Coffee House channel and it's all singer songwriters. So there, that's where you could find them. Or for instance, if you, if you abhor rap, you simply cannot with hip hop. Fire up a little Rihanna, take a listen, <laughs> see what you think. Now, so that's the first part. The second part of this is that while you're listening to this song, imagine, here's the challenge, hold on to your hats, imagine that everything the singer is doing is right. Imagine that nothing that the singer is doing will hurt them or break any rules or bring down any hammers. Just hold that in your mind and just listen with a curious mind. Listen like an artist and see if you notice anything. So you might notice something musical. You might notice some vocal things. You might notice that it feels kind of good. Maybe even a little exciting, maybe even a little interesting to listen to the artistic choices that that singer is making. You might have fun with it. So just try that. Just try that, see what you think. If you want to tell me what you think of that, I would, I would love to hear it. So this is something that you really, if you are teaching students of popular styles, any pop students, you really need to do this from time to time. Even if you don't really like pop music, you need to do it from time to time, just so that you know what your singers of popular styles are listening to and influenced by because you love your students and you don't want them to be afraid of their own voices, right? You don't want them to be like, oh, that's a bad sound. I shouldn't make that. We don't want that for our students. We love our students. We want to support them as musicians. We want them to expand joyfully into singing and music. That's what we want for them, right? Okay, I'm Meredith Colby. That's a short one today, but um, I'm Meredith Colby. Thank you for being here with me and have a great week. Bye-bye.